أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين For the hastening and the return of our imam, please recite the salawat We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this very important blessing that he has provided us with not all the believers are able to attend programs on this night not all the believers are able to enjoy the company of other believers in centers in mosques to have these programs which the holy prophet and the ahlul bayt encourage the believers on this night and on the other nights that we have which are referred to as Layal al-Qadr the nights of Qadr there is encouragement that the believers come together join together and together congregate and supplicate and try to ask for forgiveness we have a hadith sometimes believers came to the Holy Prophet <laughs> and they asked questions they said, Oh Prophet we cannot come here every single one of these nights and they ask the question, which one should we try to emphasize on? What I want to take from that hadith, from that account that we have, is the idea of coming together and trying to join and do the supplications, the a'mal together, and have some reminders before that, which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with. So it's a blessing. It's a great blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to live to see again. Again, not all the believers were able to make it to this night of Qadr, this month of Ramadan. It is truly a night for every single one of us, brothers and sisters, to make use of. The reason why this, call, this night is called Laylatul Qadr, or these nights are referred to that, or as such, is because the word Qadr refers to the concept of taqdeer what will happen over the course of the next year for the brothers and sisters is going to be put together and brought down from the heavens down to earth to the heart of the imam of our time on this night on the night of qadr okay and therefore what is going to transpire in the following year for us really does depend on the type of effort we put in on these nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with the ability to fast in the beginning of this month. Try to purify ourselves. Try to, and I hope we've been successful to a certain extent, to try to stay away from some of the wrong behavior, the wrong habits that we're usually used to over the course of this month that has passed by up to today and that has given us the ability to inshallah purify ourselves a bit more and be able to make better use of this night the important th to thing to do on this night inshallah for all of us is to try to keep that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala try to more than other nights as the Qur'an says, this night has a lot of potential. The capacity of khayr that it can have is more than all the other nights of the year. It's better than a thousand months. Okay, So it needs to be taken advantage of. All of us, inshallah. And when we come together and each of us is trying individually to do that, then collectively the effect that it's going to have on us as a group inshallah is going to be more. So one thing we want to do is try to have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The adhkar that you have on this night, 
the words that are supposed to remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are for this purpose. Another thing that happens is us asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we need. Let's not just try to think of our material needs. <coughs> it is important. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, we have reports that he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even for the salt that he would put in his food. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself is a worship. It's a good thing. It's good to ask even for the basic needs that we take for granted. We think that it's always there. We breathe it. We inhale it. We take everything for granted. All of those asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to feel that need. It is He who provides all of this for me. Okay, that's, that's good for that reason. To even ask for that. But let's not limit our supplication, our requests, our needs to this basic need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide for your financial needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care, if you put that effort in your studies, He will take care of that as well these are needs, they do need to be taken care of, but there's more important ones that we neglect Our spiritual needs are a lot more important, brothers and sisters, this life is going to come to an end. Even if you give it 24-7, you can't extend it beyond 80, 90, 100 years if we live that long. And sometimes some people when they live that long, those last few years of the, their lives, they're wishing that they didn't live this long, God forbid. What they can do is minimal. We shouldn't forget that. Don't put all of your energy on this dunya, on this world, especially the brothers and sisters that are younger. It doesn't hit us maybe at that time. But gradually when you reach an age, because that young age is an age that you can do anything with your life. You can truly do whatever you wish with that life. You want to spend it on spirituality, you want to spend it in the way of Allah, you want to spend it on the dunya, you can do all of that. You have the choice. But when you get older, you don't really have that choice too much any longer. When you get into life, when you get into the responsibilities of life, providing for your family, getting involved with communities, then everybody is just pulling you from all different directions and you really don't have that freedom and liberty to do as, we, as you wish. Don't take it for granted. There's a reason why they say youth is one of those Great blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and He's going to be asking us on the Day of Judgment, what did you do with this? Golden age. What I'm about to explain, this one example that I want to say, is far beyond me and my understanding. Maybe for some of you it's something to, to consider, but it's sometimes good to talk about something that's way above our heads, to know that, look, there's, there's things that we dream of. Every day they go around, they tell us about the new cars that are out, the new phones that are out, the new technology that's out, the new homes that you can have. And you keep seeing that, you keep wanting it, but we don't hear the spiritual highs. We don't hear those great examples in spirituality that we can become. Sayyidatullah Bahjad, may Allah bless his soul. One of the great orafa that we had. He, didn't, he hadn't even grown a beard when he was having mukashifat, when he was seeing the unseen. The veils were, were removed from before his eyes. It's doable. In your young age, you can do this, brothers and sisters. Take advantage. On this night, seriously take advantage. You will not have this opportunity always. So let's take this opportunity and try to get something for our souls as well. One of the things that we also have on this night is that this is the night that our beloved Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullah alayhi received the blow on his head. Around Fajr time is when the white beard of Amir al-Mu'mineen is colored red with his own blood. This is a very, very important time of the year. And because of this great Imam and the experience that he has had because of what happened in that history I felt what we need to take from 
these nights is to talk about our living Imam and to try to figure out our relationship with our living Imam. And God forbid if we become like those people as we mentioned in the previous night that Amir al-Munin referred to and called upon and said Ya Ashba har rijal wa la rijal O those who resemble men but are not truly men they're not, their manlyhood is gone there is no integrity there is no dignity I hope and I pray that I am not like that towards the Imam of my time I hope and pray that I am not being currently referred to by my Imam with those words because he is a living Imam and this is a serious matter okay. it's not a joke it's not an illusion it's not make-believe it's, it's real more real than everything else in our lives we tried to talk about in the previous session what was important at the beginning steps and that is to try to have that motivation to try to figure out what demotivates us what causes us not to want to move in this direction the same way that the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen when he called upon them said people we need to go we need to go for battle we need to go for this we need to go for th they were no longer responding they were too tired they lacked that motivation and I truly feel that right now in our communities for some of us at least overall the overall picture there are positives we do see movement we do we do see somewhat of a momentum but it's really not comparable to the size of our communities to the numbers that we have we should be doing a lot better than this now we, when we want to get involved with this activity when we want to mobilize, when we want to do something, when we want to have that preparation for the coming of our beloved Imam, Imam al hujjah Jalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. There are two ways that people can have this activism. There are two ways that people can start getting active and involved with work. When they see all the atrocities globally, when they see all the injustices, when they see all the problems globally and locally right here, when they see the problems in their community centers, which all of it needs to be taken into consideration, a true human being is one who sees all of that and doesn't just feel passive that, okay, that's going on and so what, let me get back to my own life. That a lot of us, unfortunately, it's seen. Inshallah, none of you are like that, but it's seen in our communities. Once we see that, what type of work are we going to do? There's two ways that people start getting active. People get motivated. And they start mobilizing, they start doing things. There's two ways that we can react to this. One of them is an individual working as an individual on this path. In other words, a very individualistic approach towards preparation for the coming of our beloved Imam that manifests itself sometimes in some of the basic things that we do for or thinking that this is in preparation for the coming of the Imam for example reciting du'as okay some people do du'a al -ahd on a daily basis great it's something to do it's a good remembrance it's a good reminder it's a good reminder to hear on a daily basis and to read and to think Allahumma hadhi bay'atul lahu fi unuqi ila yawm al This is bay'a, I'm pledging allegiance and I feel that very real connection with the Imam and I'm actually pledging allegiance, that means a lot Okay, it's good Having those a'mal, having those adhkar is good Getting involved in communities as well. When we see people getting involved in communities, again, one approach is, although it's community work, it is social work, it is getting active, it is talking about Quds Day, it is talking about what we need to do at Sabah, for example. But still, the way that it happens is in a very individualistic way, which I want to expand on. Let me talk about the sources of this a bit. Why? 
where this stems from. Why is it that in our communities especially, and the Shia community especially, we see this type of an approach. That people look at themselves, maximum their families, and even in our social work, this is the type of mindset that, that we have. Recite a salawat, please. It is good to bring to our attention that when the Holy Prophet started his movement in Mecca and then moved on to Medina, the type of activities that the Holy Prophet had were very, very, very social. They didn't have this individualistic approach towards them. Many things were done as a community. One of the things that the Holy Prophet did in Medina, as soon as he arrived, was that people were made brothers. Okay, you're thinking of brotherhood in the context of a family. You're, you get blood relationship. You're born from the same set of parents. Okay. And you understand the closeness that you have there. But when the Holy Prophet came to Medina, first thing he did, or one of the first things he did, was that people that were not even related were made brothers. They had to split things. They had to join homes. <coughs> the boundaries between people are being lowered. Okay. The way they had to interact with one another. Allah Taba Tawai has this very interesting saying in Al Mizan. I forget which verse it is that he discusses this matter. But he says all of the teachings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in the Holy Qur'an, in the Ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, every single one of them is in a very social context. You don't find anything in Islam that is outside of a social context. This is his claim. This is not me. This is someone who is, has commentary on Biharul An Anwar, okay, 110 volumes of Hadith. Someone who has commentary on the Holy Qur'an, his commentary is 20 volumes, all right? He's read Islam inside out. He's a philosopher, an arif, a faqih, an usuli, a muhaddith. Saying all of what you find in Islam is in a social context. You don't have anything that's outside of that. But for some reason we see that in our communities, things have turned a bit more individual oriented okay there's a reason for this part of the reason is that connection between the believers being cut off and not being so connected especially when it comes to very important social activities when it comes to in verse 25 of surah al-hadid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we sent down the books and we sent messengers so that people stand in justice, stand for justice, live their lives individually and socially in justice and they make justice a reality in their society. So this is the, the purpose that is mentioned in the Holy Quran. Okay. Now in doing this, that connection, that strong bond between people is key, it's crucial. You can't do that on an individual level, which we'll explain inshallah. But there's something that has happened in our history that has led to this. What is that? We see that during the time of the Ahlul Bayt, Salamullah alayhim ajma'een, recite salawat. After Amirul Mu'mineen, and after Imam al Mujtaba, Salamullah alayhi, had to accept that treaty, which there are different words to refer to. <laughs> After he accepted that, and he had to, very bravely he accepted that. The easier route would have been not to accept it and give his life in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> but he didn't. He took it the hard way. He did what his taklif was, and he accepted that. After that, the believers were facing very, very difficult times. And connecting the believers became a serious problem. Sometimes the Ahlul Bayt had to make sure that connection is unseen. 
The connection between the believers is unseen. Some of the examples that we have. Recite a salawat, please. We have Zurara ibn A'yan. Zurara ibn A'yan is one of the companions of our fifth and sixth Imam. His brief history is that he, his grandfather was Christian and he converted to Islam. Then Zurara and his brothers became Shia. They became some of the close companions of the fifth and sixth Imam. Their children also became companions of the Imams. They started learning from the Imams, the Ahadith and spreading that. He's a very, very important figure in our history. Many of the Ahadith that we have that talk about some of the basics, how to pray, we wouldn't have known had it not been for the efforts of this man. Okay. What do you do in the cases of doubt? How do you deal with Nijaza? How do you deal with Hajj? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with that? There's a, there was a famous book called Kitab Hariz, Hariz ibn Abdullah Sajistani. He's a student of Zurara. He put a book together to explain to the believers how to perform the prayer. It's through this man, Zurar ibn A'yan. Okay. So what I'm trying to show is that he's a close companion of the Imam. Sometimes he would go to the Imam, he would sit down, open his big notebook with the questions written in it, and he would ask the Imam the questions that he had, the queries that he had. The Imam would respond and he would write it down in his book. All right. He's that close with the Imam. Very close. He's got a very... Uh, tight bond with both the Imams and we can see that through some of the conversations which I don't want to take any more time on that the idea is he's a very 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 well known companion close to the Ahlul Bayt you know what the Imam had to do there's a list of Ahadith that some of the scholars including some of the including some of the academics that are doing research on our books on our fiqh on our rijal are looking at these ahadith found in Al-Kashi and they're thinking, wait a second, you all are trusting Zurara ibn A'yan, but you have a list of ahadith that are condemning this man, considering him someone who is not truly a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, and many different things are said about this man. Reliable ahadith. There's no question. The Imams have actually mentioned, that, mentioned those. But then we have some other ahadith that also need to be taken into consideration. The Imam calls upon Zurara's son and tells him, look, tell your father, I am saying these things, but it is to save him. I need to conceal the relationship he has with me in order to save his life. Okay. The connection and the communication is something that had to be hidden. During the time of the later Imams, you know, the, the situation, the circumstances became so tough because of the activism of the Imams. I don't have time here to talk about that. What they did that led to this type of a response from Ban al-Abbas. They were very active. Sometimes our impression, our understanding of the lies of, the, of our Imams is just the way sometimes I think some of us understand our maraja. Somebody sitting in Najaf or in Qum just having nothing to do in their lives except for reading books and that's it. And dua and prayer and that's it. Okay. They have no lives. They don't know what's going on in the world. The Ahlul Bayt are very active. Whether it's their worship, they're active. Whether it's feeding the poor, they're active. Social political activity, because of this problem that existed, because this was a serious battle between them and those who, who had taken their right as, as rulers, as Muslim rulers, this had to be concealed. This was something that was not made public. The last couple of Imams, you see that the Ahlul Bayt are actually put in military camps. That's why the last two Imams, Imam Hadi and Imam Al Askari, are known as Askariyain because they were brought into military camps. They could no longer have them out in the open and this just have surveillance by somebody living around them. No, they had to bring them into military camps. Try as best they can to cut off their relationship with the others, with the followers. Sometimes when the, when the companions wanted to come and ask questions, they had to be creative and think of ways how to come and ask their questions. There's an account that says this 
one of the companions wanted to go and ask some basic question, even that was not allowed. Okay. He saw somebody going around in the street that the imam lived on and he's selling something. I, I think maybe it was cucumbers he was selling. He was carrying that little tray on his head selling cucumbers. He saw the guy and he thought, okay, I can buy all of that from him and start selling it myself when I get to the door of the imam. And through that I'm able to ask my question. The connection between the imam and the people, amongst the people themselves, they had to be very, very hush-hush. Okay? Connections were there at that time, but it was very, very difficult to make that public. Another thing that we see to show how much pressure the Ahlul Bayt and their companions were under is that we have this concept in our ahadith, something that the ulama have to struggle with. We have different ahadith talking about the same subject, different views. For example, when it comes to Salatul Maghrib, the time for Salatul Maghrib, you have a set of hadith that say, Suqutul Qurs. When the sun is gone, you don't see it in the horizon anymore, that's the time for Maghrib. Okay, you have a long list of hadith that are like that. Some of the other ahadith suggest that, no, 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 that's not the time of Maghrib. The time of Maghrib is the little afterwards. When the sun has gone further down, where that redness, reddish color is up above your head. Okay. Al-Humra al mashriqiyah is gone. You have these two sets of hadith. And ulama are struggling. Which one are, gonna, are, are we going to take and how are we going to interpret this? On the issue of alcohol, we have a similar difficulty. Because we have a hadith that say, Khamr, wine itself is not najis. If it's on your clothes, it's fine, you can pray with it. And then you have a number of other hadith that say, no, that's not the case. You have different instructions. Well, we have hadith on that. The Imam tells the companion, he says, we intentionally give you different instructions. Why? Because that connection and that bond between you should be concealed. They shouldn't be able to tell that these guys are part of the same group. You guys act in this way. You guys do things in this way and they need to do things that way. So that they won't recognize that they're all followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Okay. The connection and the bond had to be concealed. After the time of the Ahlul Bayt, the pressure that was on the believers continued. But the problem that came about was the forcefulness that the Ahlul Bayt had in creating that connection and spreading out that connection throughout the Muslim empire that was something that gradually moved out okay so you have the persecutions you have the difficulties you have the pressure that makes it difficult to keep connections to be active to do something at the same time you don't have that force that was there that kept pushing people to have that connection all right this is the historic background that we have all right that has led to a lot of our studies even our fiqh some of the books that you read there's a very very individualistic approach towards everything okay you don't find what allama tawatabai says about our teachings about our fiqh being true. You don't see that social dimension in everything. You're like, where is it? I don't see it. When I read that risala, I don't see it. Yeah, you're right. When you see that risala, you don't see that. Well, there's a reason for it because all of that pressure has mounted up and people have gotten disconnected. And at times, even our houses have been almost completely cut off from society. This is a reality that has led to an individualistic approach towards religion, our understanding of religion, our practice of religion. For all these centuries. Another thing that is added here, brothers and sisters, that we need to be aware of, I'm sure some of us at least are aware of this, but we need to constantly keep ourselves aware of this, remind ourselves so we can try to move away from it. And that is, Western culture, materialist culture in general. You can't have materialism as the basis and the foundation of your ideology 
and truly be social. You can't really have that. When you get into material life, you want everything for yourself. You want more and more. You can't share with others. You are always just looking down, as we mentioned yesterday, the ahadith tell us, the examples that were given. It's like, God forbid, inshallah, none of you, and I hope myself as well, and we're not like this, but it's like an animal. It's got their head down, just grazing on grass, and just worried about their needs, and that's it. Their fellow sheep or other cows or cattle or whatever can be killed. That's, that's fine. As long as I'm grazing, it's, it's okay. Materialism leads to this. And we live in a culture that everything is about me. One of the problems that we have in marriages and the very, very high divorce rate that exists amongst Muslims out here in the West. One of the main reasons is this. Everybody's about me and what I want. And what my rights are, instead of saying, okay, how can I help? What can I do to support? Just looking at what I want. Self-centered. This is another problem that we have, an additional problem. When we came, the Muslims came over here, the Shias came over here, they had that baggage already that we're afraid, we want to keep to ourselves. Don't get involved with anything. Hush, hush. Now we come here, there's additional problems, and that is individualism that's here because of materialism. When we want to get involved with and, and become more active and mobilize, if we don't realize this baggage and the problem that, he, that exists here in this context, our development, our mobilization, our work is again going to be a very individualistic approach towards things. For example, I set up a site, I individually, and, and it's great, okay. I set up a site and I feed in all the information and I'm active, I, I you know, put that information up, I talk to people and so on, and so, but the work is being done by myself, okay. I am doing this. I think I'm doing something social. I'm providing this for the believers. This is still not the social type of readiness and mobilization. If I'm working alone to do something, even if it's addressing masses, what I'm doing, for example, here, if I'm speaking, if I come out and speak, we're all gathered here. It seems like a very social setting. But this is not really a social... This is... I am doing something right now as an individual. If we collectively connect and do something, move something forward, that's, that's when it becomes a more social activity where everybody is involved, not just present. This type of readiness as an individual is not bad, but it's not enough. It is not enough. We need to have our communities, all of us, brothers and sisters, we have got to start working towards social activism. In other words, get together as communities, as individuals that form a whole. And not just a community isolated here in Northern California, or to make it even more isolated in San Jose, in the Bay Area, or even more isolated, Saba. We shouldn't look at ourselves like that. That's, that's a wrong approach to take. Okay, this is not how we're going to be looking at ourselves. We are looking at a global community. And this is very serious. This is not a joke. Because we are, and we need to realize that. Everything is becoming more and more and more global. Globalism is something that it's not, it doesn't have a long history, but everything is just becoming smaller and smaller. Communications and everything, all right? And we see that different parts of the world is being effective on the other parts. When the Islamic awakening happened, part of it, in Northern Africa, and in the, in the Middle East, it had an effect in New York City. Okay, Non-Muslims. This is on their website. They're saying that we learned this from Al-Tahrir Square in Egypt. 
Okay. They're saying this. We're not saying this. It has an effect. It has an impact. We have to realize this. We have to wake up to this reality. It is a reality. And that's why the Imam of our time is going to be the Imam of the entire globe. His government is going to be global. All right. So we have got to start getting involved with this. When we look at, just to show in our du'as where this comes from, when you look at du'a al-iftitah, it's a very nice du'a. All right. There's many things, as we've mentioned, that we can learn from these du'as. They're not just du'as to read. There are du'as to read, reflect on, think about, learn from. Not just even in our communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather in our activities. When you look at Dua al-Iftitah, from the beginning of the Dua, it says, Allahumma adhinta li fi duaika wa mas'alatik fasma' ya sami'u midhati. I. Oh Allah, you allowed me to come and speak to you. You allowed me to praise you. You allowed me to supplicate to you and ask you for my request. So, Ya Sami'ah, the one who hears, please listen to my call. It's an individual. It's I. Alright. That beginning part of the dua, it's always I. Alright? You get to the part of the dua where the salawat begins upon the Holy Prophet in the Ahlul Bayt. At the end of that salawat, you get to the Imam of our time. After the salawat on all of the Ahlul Bayt, the, an entire chapter is about the Imam of our time in this dua that we're supposed to be reading every night in the month of Ramadan. When you look at the phrases in this part, it says, Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin karima. We, it's no longer I. Waja'alana min ad duaat ila ta'atik. Make us, I'm considering myself as part of a group of people. We want to do this collectively. Not I as an individual want to influence others and then they do it and I do... No. We want to do this collectively. Right. This is in our du'as. The reason for this, why this is so important, a couple of things. One, I'll read you one verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in the Holy Quran. It is very important for us to understand this. Those thoughts that we all have, those of us have, who have been thinking, inshallah, inshallah all of us here, those of us who have been thinking about this whole concept of an imam that's not amongst us, that we don't have connection with. He is there, he is alive, we don't have connection with directly. We cannot see him, we cannot speak to him in a way where we can hear back from him. You can speak to him and please do so. But you're not going to have somebody giving you a call, probably, unless you're very lucky, unless you've done very good, that the Imam would like to come and speak to you. And it does happen for some people. It is something to wish for, and pray for, and hope for. But why? Why all of this? And why isn't he here? Isn't, isn't the world filled with injustice already? I mean, how much more do you want? <coughs> God knows how many people are killed, raped, not receiving proper food, health services. Their intellectual side, as we mentioned last night, the greatest oppression that's happening is people being kept away from Islam, being given wrong information, misinformation about Islam. All this is, how much more do you want? What's going on here? This verse explains, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah, Surah Ar-Ra'ad, verse 11. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi'anfusihim. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not change the circumstances of a people unless they decide to change. Alright. The important thing that I'm trying to take from this, this is a very important concept. There's a multiple... Uh, conclusions and multiple points that we can derive from this. One of them is thinking about the idea 
of the free will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given people that exists in individuals, it exists in communities and society at large as well. People collectively make choices. You are constantly making choices. Right now you're making choices. Not just individual choices, you're making social choices. And they impact what happens. Because the verse continues and says, فَلَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ وَإِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ سُوءًا فَلَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ there's a relationship between what you do as an individual and what you do as a society. On the impact and what happens, the end result. There is an effect, there is a result of the actions, not just individually. People talk about, about the hereafter and so on and so forth. The society as well, people collectively making decisions, there is an outcome. That's either going to be good or bad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse says, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ سُوءًا فَلَا مَرَدَّ لَهُ If you make choices that are going to lead to that negative consequence, there's no escape from it. This is, God has designed in this way. You, take those, you make those choices, you remain silent, others oppress, that combination, you're going to have disaster. Your choices are going to count. So one thing that we have is that we want to take from this is the idea of our choices individually coming together, forming a collective will is going to have an impact on the coming of our Imam and on many other things as well. But the other thing I want to take from this is the idea, it says, in Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma bi'anfusihim The qawm, that group of people have got to change themselves collectively. This is what we want to take from this. Not an individual separated from others trying to you know, say some things, but remain an individual. Have that individual, individualistic mindset. No. You have to consider yourself part of a whole. You have to work with others. And this leads to the second point, why, why this is very important. Working with others, coming together. The more difficult things. Sometimes we get motivated, we want to do something. Then when we come together to actually do it, it falls apart. We can't stand each other. I want to do something, you want to do it differently. Okay. And that's when it all falls apart. <clears throat> this is extremely important for us to have the experience of working together. And building on this experience in order to have the Imam of the time coming. Where do I get this from? I'll give you two examples. It's important for us to study, brothers and sisters, the history. We don't have to only study the history of the Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about many stories in the Holy Quran because there's lessons for us to learn. We have a history that's recent history. Some of it's unfolding right before our eyes right now, okay, that we need to look at and try to learn from. There are two revolutions that happen over 30 years apart. One revolution is the Islamic Revolution in the Islamic Republic of Iran, what's now known as the Islamic Republic of Iran. Right? This is one experience we have. We have another experience, which is the Egyptian Revolution, that has, is unfolding right now. And we hope that there is success beyond what we have up to this point. We hope that there's a lot more success in that, and we pray for that. You have these two examples. The Islamic Revolution in Iran was a revolution that people, groups of people, ulama and religious people, started getting active and started working together where there was actually a network within Iran. When they wanted people on the streets, it wasn't just some isolated place in Tehran that you had people on the streets. No. People were so connected and there was so much communication working together when they wanted people out, they would have them in Isfahan, in Mashhad, in Ahwaz, in, in Tehran, in Qom, in Tabriz, in all these different cities. Alright? There's a connection, there's a bond. People are working together. They already had a group of people before the Shah was even out. They had a council to make decisions on how to move the revolution forward. Well, they have this, they've built those bonds beforehand. They've learned from that experience over the course of over 15 years. Okay? When the revolution succeeds, 
You don't see people wondering, oh, what are we going to do? No, there's, there's already a core group of people organized. They set up the judiciary. They start working towards setting up elections. They had elections a few months after the revolution. And they set it up. They didn't have any foreign help and support. They did it themselves. This requires a lot of group work, you know, teamwork. Millions of people spread out throughout this country setting up an elections that those many people are going to be active in and making it very clean elections that's pretty big that required the experience and you didn't have what you have on the streets of Egypt okay when you look at the example of Egypt on the other hand when you look at the example of Egypt people were fed up with difficulties that they were facing under the Mubarak regime. So they mobilized. They came on the streets. There were people. There were a large number of people that were out there. It seems very social. But see, there's that bonding is not there. It's not there. That's why it falls apart. A year after the elections where they have a democratically elected president in, a year after that they can easily mobilize masses Confuse the masses to come out on the street. I'm not a very strong supporter of Muhammad Morsi in the sense that you know I agree with his stances, but this was a democratically elected president, okay, and he did have Islamic agendas, even if we don't agree with it fully. But after one year, the people who couldn't even stand this much Islam came and mobilized the masses, and I hope he got well, not him necessarily, but. The people's movement reaches a stage where they're back in control instead of the military and the outside powers. Okay, the, the bonding, working together, trusting each other, having that experience is not there. Okay, and this is what, what they lacked over there. One of the problems that Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi faced in his time is this problem. When that revolution, which is not really a revolution that Amir al-Mu'mineen supported, the riots against Uthman in Medina that caused the people to kill Uthman against Amir al-Mu'mineen's will, they came and they begged him to lead them. And after them begging and insisting, Amir al-Mu'mineen accepted. But it didn't take five years even. It did not take five years. The people were so divided. The companions of the Imam not too many strong ones. If you look at after the five years, six months of Imam al-Mujtaba, you see even the close companions that remained are so fragmented that Imam Hassan has to accept that peace treaty. He has no choice. They had large numbers. The bonding was not there. Working together was not there. They weren't collectively doing things. This guy wanted his own thing, that guy wanted his own thing. They're working for their own personal gains and benefits. Again, having that materialistic mindset that led to the problems that you see in that history. I hope that we have the blessing of this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with the ability to understand our responsibilities further and to move in that direction so that we can say, Ya Sahib al Zaman, we did our share. Okay. We did get involved, not as an individual, we mobilized as a group, as a community, and we connected. Inshallah. Sallallahu alayk. Sallallahu alaykum ya ahla bayt al Nubuwah. Sallallahu alaykum ya ahla bayt al صلى الله عليكم يا 
أهل بيت النبوة وما وضع الرسالة ومختلف الملائكة ومهبط الواحية ومعدن الرحمة وخزان العلم ومنتهى الحين May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you My beloved Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt It was in your homes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with guidance and revelation May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you Angels descend upon you Day in and day out Sallallahu alayhi Ya May Allah's peace and blessings be upon you. My beloved Amirul Mu'minin The one that was oppressed beyond imagination Let's go and take our hearts to Kufa this is the last night of our beloved Amirul Mu'mineen Spending time with his family, with his daughters, with his sons <coughs> Sallallahu alayka ya mawla They say the Imam this night is looking in the sky. He looks at the stars. He's pondering and reflecting. He says, Allah's will will be implemented. There's no escape from destiny. This is the night that I was promised. He spent the night at Iftar over one of his daughter's homes. When his daughter brought some bread, salt, and milk, Amirul Mu'mineen, according to what is said, has said, O oh, daughter of mine When have you seen Ali Having two things to have with bread I wish that you would take one And I would prefer that you take the milk away He had bread and salt on this night Usually Amir al muminin would go to the masjid For his night prayers and this night he stayed home, recited his prayers at home, 
His children are seeing him, wondering what is happening. Our father is not behaving normally. What is going on? The city of Kufa, with all the memories that Amir al Mu'mineen has had, is getting prepared to lose this great Imam. All the oppressions and atrocities that the Imam has taken in this city, all the oppressions and all the disrespect that he has seen from people are coming to an end. The days that he would be walking in the streets, helping people, giving them bread and food, but hearing from them, cursing Ali. Salamullah alayk, ya madloom, ya mawlai. Amir al Mu'mineen, on this night, I feel he begins the process of being relieved. On the 21st of the month of Ramadan, Amir al Mu'mineen is relieved of all the hardships that he had to take. All the hardships he had to take in Medina when they came to his door and before his eyes the daughter of the Prophet was disrespected. Ya Amir al Mu'minin, Ruhi Post the Fajr time, the Imam hears the call for prayer. The Muaddin gives the Adhan. The Imam goes, goes towards the Masjid. Hujr ibn Adi hears the whispers of some of the Shayateen in the Masjid. He realizes there's a plot. He runs and rushes to see if he can catch Amir al Mu'mineen. Ya Ali, don't come to the Masjid. But he took a route. God wanted Ali to go to the Masjid. Amir al Mu'mineen had already left. He took a different route. Amir al Mu'mineen comes into the masjid, one account says. Amir al Mu'mineen begins the prayer. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Imagine Amir al Mu'mineen saying those last prayers. Saying his Hamdan Surah, the noble Imam going into Ruku, going into Sujood. All we know is some people started hearing the call, La Hukma illa lillah. Then they hear another call, Fustu Rabbil Kaaba. <laughs> Amir al Mu'mineen receives the blow on his head. Blood is coming down from all directions. The beard of Amir al Mu'mineen is colored red. In the state of sujood, as he wished, Amir al Mu'mineen always wished to be killed by the sword in the way of Allah. Now he's received it in God's house in the masjid. So of course he he shouts out, "Fustu Rabbil Kaaba!" I received this blessing and victory from God. Imagine Imam Al Mujtaba who's around seeing his father like that. This was not a normal soul. 
Lord. Ibn Muljam al Mal'oon made sure that sword is going to finish off Amir al Mu'mineen. He paid a thousand dirham or dinar to have it poisoned. Amir al Mu'mineen, Ruhi Fidak, Imam al Mujtaba comes. Probably taking Amir al Mu'mineen in his arms, allowing his head to rest, trying to see what is happening. <laughs> Amir al Mu'mineen is carried home. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, some say that when Amir al Mu'mineen was being carried home, Close to the house, Amir al Mu'mineen realized he's gotten close to the house. He said, Companions, put me down. I need to take these steps myself. But they said, Ya Ali, you're not in a position to do that. You're losing blood. They say Amir al Mu'mineen responded by saying, I can't allow my daughter Zainab to see this. Aqilatu Bani Hashem has already suffered enough when she saw her mother being beaten on when she was a child. I can't allow her to see me like this. We say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you didn't want Zainab to see you walking home like that, covered in blood. Where were you in Karbala? When the lady Zainab called, Wa Muhammad, Wa Aliya. Finding Tallu Zaylabiya from that hill, looking down and seeing her brother with Shimru Jalisun ala Sadrim. Ya Umm al Masaib, Ya Aqilatu Bani Hashem. We express our condolences to you, also to the Imam of our time.